morning. Good morning. A warm welcome to all this communion Sunday. To those who are in the church, the car park, who listen online or CD later, we extend a very warm welcome to the Reverend Michael Curry, Minister of First Cookstown, on his first visit to Auditor, and we trust that we will feel at home amongst us, and we look forward to what he has to share with us. This is a communion Sunday with a difference, and we trust that you will feel comfortable with the new arrangements because of COVID-19. Waste cartons can be put in the bins on your way out. Safety is still a priority when it comes to worship, so, so we must continue to observe all the regulations on our way in and out of church. Wednesday at 8pm, Zoom prayer meeting. Speaker next Sunday will be the Reverend Mark Dodds. And tomorrow is the deadline for voting members of this congregation to propose names of possible candidates for the vacancy in writing or email to Surdy Black or Mark Dodds. Annual reports will be given out at the gates today by the McCone children. And now I will hand you over to Mark. Reverend Curry. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Morris, for your words of welcome uh, this afternoon. It's lovely to be here with you. It is indeed my first time in order. I've driven past the church a few times, always sort of wondered what it looked like inside, but I had a bit of a tour this morning, so it's nice to be here and hopefully. Uh, we know God's blessing during our time here together this morning. Um, as was mentioned, we are going to meet around the Lord's table later in our service, and uh, I believe it hasn't been done here before since lockdown measures weren't reduced. And um, you will uh, pick up a little uh, pod on the way in. It's a little bit like those, um, you know, the UHT milk cartons used to get. Maybe you still do. And um, but again, the first layer will have your bread beneath it, and then there's another layer you peel back, and you have your your juice or your wine below that. Listen, it might feel a little bit. I use a kind of word here, a bit fittery in your hands. But listen, we won't rush anybody when we come to the Lord's table. We want to do so respectfully and reverently as we do so together. So we'll get to that a little bit later in our service. But I want to read a verse from 1 Timothy chapter 1 as I call to worship today. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Those are words that were very much in the mind and the heart of Walter Chalmers Smith as he wrote the words of our first hymn we're going to stand together and sing, which is immortal, invisible, God only wise. Let us stand together as we sing to the glory of God.
Lord's name and praise and now let's still our hearts as we come to him in prayer. Let's pray together. Father God, we come before you today acknowledging that you are the only one who is immortal, invisible, the only one who is wise and we know you're the only one who is perfect in holiness and righteousness. And we come before you in the attitude of worship today because that is the only appropriate response to you. Yet, Lord, the measure of our praise can never match the wondrous measure of your mercy and grace. Our lips can never fully express the depth of gratitude that we have in our hearts for everything that you've done for us in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Lord, you alone are the one who is abounding in mercy. You are steadfast in love. The one who is high and mighty, above all powers and thrones, above all rulers of this world. You are the one who is seated in the splendour of your holiness, surrounded by angels without number who constantly sing your praises, veiling because of your glory and splendour and holiness. You are the God before whom we do not have to pretend. You are the one who has made, has made us. You are the one who cares for us. You are the one who knows us even better than we know ourselves. You are aware of our struggles or feelings or anxious thoughts. The disappointments we know in life, the joy that we know, and I follow you know about them all. And we thank you that you are ever faithful, ever sure, and uh, you're a constant in a world that, Lord, is ever changing, a constant in lives that are ever changing with the passing of time. And we thank you that you provide a steadfast hope, that you're sovereign over all things, that your providential hand has been evident from before time began. And we can trace the promises of your covenant from creation right through to the day and indeed right into eternity. And we praise you that we do see your hand in action in all things. How you remember and you care for your people even when we're so undeserving of that care. How your promise of a saviour is, is one faithfully filled in Jesus and we bless you that your promises remain true and that they remain the source of our hope of forgiveness of redemption. Of eternal life. Today we thank you for your patience, that you are indeed long-suffering, that you're not quick to condemn, and that forgiveness is found with you, because Lord, if you marked our sin and iniquity, no one could stand before you, because we are all guilty, we all fall short of your standard and of your glory. So we come in confession before you, acknowledging our unworthiness, confessing our sin, Trusting in that gracious forgiveness that you grant to us when we repent. Knowing it's only possible for, because of what Jesus has accomplished for us on the cross at Calvary. Where the price of our sin was paid through the shedding of that blood and through his death on the cross. So Lord we come trusting in your goodness and your mercy. And we do trust Lord that today as we meet together to worship. That as we open your word together as we meet around the table. This would be a blessed hour to all who are here. At a time when we are still in our hearts, at a time when we hear your voice speaking clearly to us, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible with you, please do turn with me to Luke chapter 15. So we'll find those three lost parables. We're going to think about the, the third and the final one today, which is the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son, if you're reading in maybe an older translation. So Luke chapter 15 beginning at verse 11, and we'll read through to verse 32. Luke chapter 15, verse 11 and following, and this is the word of God. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate, so he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to be a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best rope and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fat and calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your money with prostitutes, comes home, you kill a fat and calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Amen. And we know that God does indeed bless the reading of his word to our hearts. Okay, boys and girls, see a few of you out this morning. Give me a wave wherever you're at, if you feel young enough. It's great to see you're quite far back, aren't you? Can you hear me okay? You're very far back. Okay, listen, I'm going to have a wee short talk with you this morning. Um, I want to think about signs this morning, okay? We see signs around us everywhere in life. I'm sure there's plenty of signs in at school, you see. There's signs out in the main street. Everywhere in life we see signs. So um, I hope you're able to see the picture of the first one. Um, I have a picture of it here actually as well, so I'll hold up, it's coming up there anyway. Okay, so this is the first sign. Can you all see it okay, yeah? Have you seen that sign, anything like this recently? It's, um, I'll describe those out in the car park, I forgot to do this in Clagan actually. It's uh, blue and white, there is a blue circle in the middle of the page, there's people that seem to be sneezing sort of thing in the middle of it, and there looks like there's germs everywhere anyway. And then there's a, there's a big sign saying 2M. Anybody know what that sign might mean or what it might yet see a hand here in the back? Two metres apart or six foot. And you know, apparently, if you stretch your arms out, that's near enough guide to the height you are. Now, I, I never made six foot, sadly. I, I say I'm nearly six foot, but I feel a wee bit short. Just, but that, that's rough the distance. We have to stay apart from everybody. And we see it in church. We see it in school. We see it in the shops we're in. But that's what that sign is telling us. Look, stay a safe distance or keep everybody safe. That's been the message over the past year. So well done. That is to keep two metres or six foot apart. Keep that social distancing. Next, I have another one. Okay, so this is like a blue background and there's a white arrow on it. So anybody, you might see this if you're driving about, well, hopefully you're not driving about, but if you're sailing about in the car with someone, you might have seen this. Maybe that direction, maybe you see the sign that way pointing up, maybe that way, anybody? Yeah? One direction, and it's not the pocket we're talking about, sure it's not. That's the road sign, absolutely. So this is one direction, which means if you're going down the street, you can only go this way, you can't turn and come back up it, or the traffic wardens will go mental with you, the police might even not be too pleased either, but that's what that sign means, when we see that it means one way. You can only go one way down that particular street or road. Next picture is perhaps my favourite. Okay, I hope you can see it okay. Uh, it's a little bit smaller here, but I don't want to explain this or I'll give it away to those outside, but it's something you might see on the street. Okay, if you're walking down the street, there's one of these in Cookstown, I believe, down the main street. Um, it's outside a certain shop and it tells us, it's a sign that tells us something about the shop we're walking past. Anybody? What about this side of the church? Just shout out, yeah? And the sign says, not go in the shop. Uh, no, uh, no, 
when I see this sign, I, I find it very hard not to go into the shop. Okay, can you, can you not see what's outside in the street? We're getting into the weather for this as well, if that's a clue. What do you see out on the street? Uh, uh, you're far too good. You see the McDonald's sign, don't you? Goodness me. Uh, your, your, eyes, your eyesight's too good. <laughs> you know. Yes, what, is that your sister beside you? Yeah. It is ice cream. Uh, you, we're going to get there eventually, don't worry about it, but it's ice cream. And if you're walking down the street, sometimes you see these big plastic ice creams sitting outside and it's saying to you, come in, come in and buy ice cream, Michael. That's what it's saying to me anyway. And it's, oh, it's lovely, isn't it? Do you like ice cream? Who doesn't like ice cream? Not one hand on it. We all love ice cream, don't we? And that again is a sign in the street. Come on in here. So the next time you're walking down the street and you see that, you know, just give mum or dad a wee mum, mum, dad ice cream or the soft touch granny and granddad. They're so easy to talk them to buying the ice cream, okay? So they're all signs, okay? We have uh, keep our social distance two metres apart, we've one way down the street, and then we have the big ice cream sometimes you see out in the street. Outside shops like um, there's not Morelli's is down the main street, but there are other establishments that sell ice cream. Just have to put it out there. Um, but I've one other picture to show you today, and I actually have the equivalent here in these little pods. Can anybody tell me that it's there for you? So you shout out the answer what we can see. Anybody? What this fella here? Can you see what what are we look at? You know? Yeah. Bread and wine. Absolutely right. And that's the sign. You see, God has given His church signs, things to remember what he has done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the bread and the wine are what we do when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, as sometimes called, or we come to the Lord's table, or um, when we have communion. All different words for the same thing. And what happens then is that those who know Jesus, who have asked him to be their saviour, asked him to forgive their sins, they come and they eat bread and they drink. It's not wine, it's just like juice it's in the little cartons and it's a little bit different in church. There used to be everything was all set on the table down in front, I'm sure. But now we have these little pods to use, but it doesn't lose the, what the sign means to us. The sign, when we meet around the Lord's table, is to remind us of when we eat the bread, that's to remind us that Jesus gave his body for us. When he died on the cross, he gave his body. And the, the, the juice or the wine, as we call it, means that Jesus shed his blood on the cross. So whenever you hear people talking about the Lord's table or the Lord's supper or communion, we know that that's a sign that God has given his church, something we do. And when we do it, we remember what Jesus has done for us. And what Jesus has done for us is incredible and so, so important. Because we have this problem in our lives called sin. And no matter how good we try to be, no matter how much we try not to sin, we mess up, don't we? We always get things wrong. We always lose you know, our temper sometimes. We get annoyed. We get frustrated. But because Jesus died on the cross, we can have our sins dealt with. We can have our sins forgiven. And when we eat the bread, when we drink the wine or the juice, it's simply a sign that God has given his church. We remember all that Jesus has done for us. He came to be the saviour of the world. Listen, there is a wee verse. Yep, it's come up now. I'll tell you what I'll do. Um, I'll read it out first, and then we'll all sit together. Not just the boys and girls, we'll all sit together after two. So I'll, I'll sit first. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show others about the Lord's death until he comes. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. So after two, let's hear it all nice and loud. One, two. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show others about the Lord's death until he comes. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. So the next time you're out at uh, school or wherever and you see social distancing signs, the next time you're sailing, not driving in the car, and you see a one-way sign, remember what that points to. Don't forget the ice cream. And of course, remember that one of the best, best signs you've been given is communion. The Lord's table, because it points us as a sign towards what Jesus Christ has done for us. Listen, thank you everybody for answering so well. And great to see you in church this morning, but it was a good habit to have to come to church every day. Hopefully I'll continue all through your life. I want to speak to everyone else now, just we're going to think about that parable I read just a few moments ago. Uh, so if you do have a Bible open, that might be helpful to you. 
What is a parable? Don't want an answer, but I suppose the standard Bible class or Sunday school answer you might get is that earthly story with a heavenly meaning. But a more accurate answer goes a little bit deeper than that. You could compare a parable to a stained glass window that we see in church. Here's a perfect example to my left hand here to hold the Lamb of God. And we're inside the building, so we can read that perfectly. Behold the Lamb of God. But if we were outside church and looking in through the window, we would find it hard to work. We would have to really think and maybe do a bit of guesswork as to what that might say. A parable is a little bit similar because it's clear to those who are in the kingdom of God, who have gospel knowledge, they understand what a parable means. Yet to those who are outside of the kingdom of God, who don't understand the gospel, sometimes they just don't get what a parable is saying to them. But we have this parable of the lost son or the prodigal son, if maybe we're using an older translation. And it involves three main characters. And and each character is representative of certain individuals or certain people groups, if you like. And I want to look at these three main characters today. And I believe this is a, a parable of salvation that will come clear as we look at this parable today. And I'm going to finish by thinking about a a sting in the tail. Because every parable we read always has a sting in the tail, always something that just throws us at the end. So first we're going to think about the youngest son. This young son is unhappy. He's unsettled at home, and it's not because he's been given a hard time. It's not because his home is a bad home. We're not made aware of any abuse going on, any extreme hardship. His his dad's not giving a hard time or undermining him or anything. But if we were to use a word to describe or sum up this younger son, we might say that he was worldly. He has no desire to remain at home. He wants to see the world. He wants to sample what the world has to offer. And it appears that he's just simply fed up with the uh, the mundane aspect of life, the, 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 the daily regime, the, the boredom of life. He wants a bit more freedom. He wants to make his own way in the world rather than you know be told to do what uh, be told what to do by somebody else. He doesn't want to be restricted by life under his father's roof, which is life under his father's rule. And things come to a head one day, he he goes to his father, he asks him for a share of the inheritance, and and on receiving it, he heads off, we are told, to a distant land, a distant country. What this mean? Well, it meant that freedom beyond his wildest dreams was his. Not only had he the money to do what he pleased, you know, now he could make the rules. You know, he could say when he would go to bed, when he would get up in the morning. He could be with whoever he wanted to be. He could hang up with hang out with whatever crowd he wanted to hang out with. There were no questions asked, no accountability. He could be himself. He could express himself during this period. And don't miss what we're talking about. There's several things I'll draw your attention to in the parable. And hopefully you might see something new today. I know you've probably heard this parable preached many times. Before. Hopefully it might be something new for you today. But don't miss what we read in in verse 12 here. Now the younger son got together all he had uh, and set off. Now this this was not your your typical young person heading off to uni where they're home from time to time to spend the night in their own bed in their own bedroom. Of course they're home to get the washing and learning, going to get that. They're home to read the fridge, to take some uh, food back up to their digs at uni. Yep, that goes with it. But for the younger son, you know, this is it. He is determined. He's resolved. There's going to be no turning back. There's going to be no returning home. He's left for good. I'm going to make a go of this. And initially things are awesome. They are great. He was popular. He had friends. He was the life and soul of the party, or with those who were the life and soul of the party. This is what life should be like. And and notice, notice what we are not told here in this parable. The scriptures do not deny the lure of instant gratification that comes from that type of lifestyle. Partying, 
being part of the M crowd. However, what do we see happening here? Everything comes crashing down around him. Everything falls down around him. Severe famine came into the land and he had spent everything. He, he had blown his money. Whole country experiences this tough economic decline, this uh, drop into hardship. And he, he's part of that as well. So he again shows this determination not just to run back home the first time of trouble. He, he hires himself out to a citizen of that country to be given a job of tending pigs and it was awful, nothing wrong with looking after pigs. But for a young Jewish man tending what were regarded as unclean animals, it wasn't what you did, it wasn't the dumb thing. And you know from the, the high he felt, that brief time he had where he was with the in crowd, you know, the party lifestyle, doing what he wanted, living how he wanted, no accountability. You know, from the highs that, that brought, very soon we see this dramatic fall to the very bottom. He, he's, he's in the pits, we might say, but he's down, he's low. And it goes without saying, we know the parable, don't we? The friends that he was so popular with, they disappear. It's like snow off a dike, as we say in kind of those who were there when he had plenty to spend on wild living and to, to share and to throw around him. But they weren't his friends. Of course they weren't. They didn't care. They were takers. They were nothing more than those hangers on. We could call them parasites, just taking what they could from this young man. So his greatest need is, I suppose the same as our greatest basic need is for food, for survival. And his hunger, we are told, is such he would even have eaten the pods that the pigs were eating and that I'm sure was something absolutely disgusting and revolting but he was considering eating them. But notice what takes place, the, the, the steps if you like the son has taken. You know, he, he's not happy living under the rule of the father. So what does he do? He, he kicks against, he rebels against it. He, he's someone who desired living and total independence. You know, I'll do what I want to do. I don't want to be ruled or have rules set by somebody else over me. He, want, he wanted to live life as he pleased to do so. And he wasted his inheritance. He didn't show good stewardship of what he had been given. And, and they're all, we can see all those, they're gospel principles, aren't they? And notice the reverse steps which suggests to us this is a parable of salvation because the steps that he takes see him return to the Father. He realized his condition. And you know, sometimes that's the, the hardest thing for us to realize. You see, sin can blind us to our true condition. It makes us think we're happy when really deep down we're not. It can make us think that, you know what, we have so much freedom when actually we can't see the slaves that we've become to something. We can have that quick fix, that instant gratification, but over time it's not enough. We want something less superficial, something less shallow, something more, I don't know, more, more deep, more, more meaning to it than, than the world can give. See, the scriptures remind us the wages of sin. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, we are told. And we see the same behaviour in the young son as we did away back in the very start in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve, they believed the devil's lie. Young man believed the world's lies that life will be great. Adam and Eve, they believed the lie that surely you will not die even if they were awakened to their sin, they doubted the seriousness of the consequences of their sin. But the young son also confessed his sin here. And we know he was genuinely sorry for what he had done. And notice he doesn't try to explain his behaviour. You know, I was just experimenting. He, you know, the excuse many offer when they sample the world and it all crashes down around them and they're left in an awkward position. Many lives spoiled through just some foolish decisions taken at a young age. But, but notice how he also doesn't try to lay the blame at the feet of others. You know, life was, it was impossible living at home under him. You know you what know, dad's like, the, the rules, that, oh, just a constant nagging. You know, he didn't blame or lay the blame there. He didn't lay the blame at others to encourage him to walk in the lifestyle he adopted. 
But notice, and as much as he has sinned against his father, ultimately he states here in verse 18, tells us he had sinned against heaven. He recognizes this. And, and we see him acting. He acts in that he returns to the Father. And again, sometimes the most difficult part of realizing we're in a bit of a mess, we've done something wrong, even if we say, you know, I must confess of this sin, it's acting on it. That's so hard. Maybe you've done something and you, you realize I'm going to have to swallow my pride here and go and apologize. Maybe you're going to have to have that difficult conversation with someone. Most people, I'm sure we all find that difficult, don't we? But at the same time, it's important. And the son here, you know, in verse 20, we are told he got up. He went to the father. On his return, what happens? We know the story. Father welcomes him. He, he's standing looking in the distance for him. He, he welcomes him. Open arms, big hug. What a home son. Best robe given to him, something given to special guests. He's given a ring, something signifying authority. He's given sandals and, and the, the symbolism there is that sandals represent that he, he was a free man. He was no longer a slave. This son of the father was not going to be a slave. He's not going to go barefoot. The fat and calf, well, that's kept for a really special occasion. What can we say? Fat and calf. There's a celebration coming. Then secondly, we think about the father. Imagine how hard it must have been for the father to hear those words from his son. Give me my share of this. Give me my inheritance. You see, that's something the younger son would have received at the time of his father's death. And it must have pained the father to hear his, this and, and to watch his son head off into the horizon for a distant country and all the dangers, all the, the fears of father, all the, the possibilities that things would go wrong. You see, the younger son wanted more than the father could give him. He wanted more than you know, the father was prepared to allow him to have. And he wanted what he could get from the father at the same time. But didn't want that responsibility. Didn't want that accountability. Didn't want to have to live under his father's rule. And we see the father acting here with such graciousness. He doesn't turn a word in the son. He doesn't try and persuade him to stay. And, and no doubt he wanted to. Yes, he probably said, you know what, you'll receive your inheritance in good time if you can just wait. But he doesn't try and stop his son from heading off to a far off land. And no doubt he wanted to. Probably realised, you know what, his mind's made up. He's a passionate young man. Anything I say, he's not going to listen anyway. I'm not going to change his mind. I'm not going to convince him to stay. See, the father loved both sons, and we will see that as we work our way down through this parable, but the, the love that he had for them wasn't uh, a possessive love. He, he bound to have been, you know, no doubt heartbroken at his son's desire for this independence and freedom, but he keeps his counsel, his thoughts, he keeps his feelings to himself. And we may ask the question, you know, that the father, did the family know anything of the son's plight while he was in that far off land? And there are clues in the passage, if we look for them, that suggest they did know something of what was going on. We'll, we'll get to one of those obvious ones a bit later. But we might ask you, well, why did they not go and try and get him and bring him home? Why not send him some more money or send him a, a food parcel or a care package or something? I mentioned that Luke 15 is got three lost parables in it and we, we find there the, the, the lost coin, uh, the lost sheep and the, um, the lost son. The lost son's a little bit different. You know, when the lady lost, the, or the shepherd lost the, the sheep, he, he went in search of it till he found it and brought it home back and, and then there was celebrating and there was people rejoicing in the good news. The lady that lost the coin she searched for it until she found it, then her friends all came around and were celebrating the, the good news. A little bit different what we see happening here. You see, the father did not set out and seek out the younger son to go, get him wherever he was, get him back home. But it didn't prevent him 
from watching and waiting. Didn't mean he didn't care about his son. Didn't mean he didn't love his son. No, day after day he waited, gladly willing to obey him. But this move to return to the Father began with the Son. It's the Son who made the first move. And we do see him returning, we are told, while he was still a long way off, and the Father again watching into the distance for some, maybe today, maybe today. How many days that happened, we don't know. But when he sees him a long way off, he does something that is irregular, something outside of what's the normal, something where social protocol it was thrown out the window as he ran to meet his son. What do I mean by that? Well, have you ever seen the Queen run? I haven't. Have you ever seen Kate run? Yes, we've seen Princess Kate run on Sports Day, don't we? We see her all the time, don't we? There's always pictures of that the newspapers run the, the news at night. But if and when William becomes king, she won't run in public. It's just not what you do. It's not what the Queen does. But for the father here, you know, protocol, what was socially accepted. Everything was forgotten. Everything was chucked out the window. Such was his joy at the son's return and, and this welcome embrace. And, and then, just as it was with the lost sheep and the lost coin, friends and neighbours invited to join and celebrate, rejoicing the good news. My son was, was dead, he's alive again, he was lost, he is found. Thirdly, we see the older brother. You know, if the parable ended where they began to celebrate and we didn't have the next few verses in scripture, we would not think anything about that. We would happily read on to the next chapter. But we're told here there is something different, something unusual that happens as we're told a little bit about the older son. And we've only had a mention at the beginning. We know this father has two sons. We've heard nothing of the older son up until this point. But in hearing the news that the younger brother is home, the older brother's reaction, he is angry, he is furious, he is raging, he is stubborn. He's disappointed, he comes and sees these celebrations going on, hears the music, the dancing. He, he refuses to go in and participate. And his father goes and, and pleads with him, but he's so angry. That he confronts the father and he says words to the effect of him. Listen, I've always been loyal to you. I've been here working hard and, and as ever, when does he come across the party? He's coming in from the fields, the, 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 the crater. He was out doing a day's hard work in the fields. I've obeyed you, he said. I've been loyal to you. I've been faithful to you. What have I received? Nothing. You've given me nothing. And this older brother is struggling to understand how and why his father is so happy about the return of this wayward son, this prodigal, this irresponsible brother who, who took his inheritance, who, who wasted it, who blew it. How he acted in the way that he did. And, and he struggled to understand why all this celebration, why everyone's pandering to this younger son after the way he had behaved. And he uses sharp words, hurtful words, bitter words here. You know, verse 30, this son of yours, he said, who squandered your property with prostitutes. There's one of those clues I mentioned. The older son knew the type of lifestyle his younger brother had been practicing. Yet he says, you, you give him the robe, you give him the ring, you give him the sandals, you kill the fattened calf for him. And he couldn't even bring himself to call him his brother. And he, he seeks to justify his actions by laying the blame for what happened at the feet of his father. And you know, with these words, the older son, he separates himself from his father every bit as much as the younger son had done through his actions. Back to the father. Just as the actions of the youngest son had hurt the father deeply, these stinging words of the older brother also hurt the father. The youngest son had come home, he had repented, the younger son is now separating himself from his father and distancing himself from his younger brother. And the father shows the same love, he shows the same patience, the same uh, grace to his older son. He says, you know, you're always with me, everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours, you know, he was dead, he's now alive, he was lost, he's now found. 
And the father flips the words here, you know, and he says to the older brother, this brother of yours. What's this thing in the tail here to, to finish with? Well, 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 this parable, like every other parable we read, was carefully told in the presence of a great range of people. And it was told in order to teach those who were there about the kingdom of God, to challenge ideals and behaviours, but it was done in such a way that to many who heard it, it's just simply a story. But every person, as I said at the beginning, represents an individual or a people group here. The Father represents God. It's not too difficult to work out. The one who is always welcome. The one who acts to help. The one who always acts to help and support, who shows care and love for all. The one who is gracious, who is slow to anger, is patient, he's loving, he's accepting. The younger son represents the, 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 the tax collectors and the sinners who that group of people that Jesus lumped together always, the sinners and tax collectors always thrown in there as well. They've gathered to hear Jesus and, and, and you know, we're not supposed to adopt the younger son's model for, for living as something we would do. Yet at the end he is the one who does act in the right way. He comes, he, he repents of his sin. You know, it's a parable of salvation because it proclaims the good news of the gospel to all who hear it. Those who have turned and walked away from God, they rather live life as they want to live it. They seek that so-called freedom that we think we have if we live life without God. But the good news of the gospel is we always find that gracious Father waiting with open arms, willingly to receive whoever will repent of their sin and come back to him. But the older brother, I think he's the most fascinating character we have in this parable, and he represents the, the muttering Pharisees and teachers of the law. And you know, when we first read the parable, we get the older brother. You know, he's hardworking. He's committed. He's loyal. He has never hurt his father by his actions. That's until we see the reality of his heart revealed, which is so hard against his brother, and he turns that against his father. And it reminds us of the mystery that God will save, who he will save, and, and we, you know, God's people, Christian people, we are to rejoice when a sinner comes to faith, when a sinner is saved. And it's not just because we know that's what we're supposed to do. You put a smile on your face. We are to be genuinely happy regardless of how they may have acted in the past or what they may have done at one point in their lives. You know, Christians are to be people who happily welcome sinners who repent, who don't continue to point out or drag up their past or what they have done. So there's a lesson for those who may be a little bit self-righteous here, those who feel that little bit morally superior to others around them. I think there's a great warning in this parable, a great sting in the tail as if those who might seem to be close to God, close to the Father, who from the outside might tick all those boxes, who, who look the part, who, who say the right things, they might really be missing the joy of a true relationship with God because they see him as nothing more than a taskmaster, someone they have to obey rather than knowing God to be that loving, good God, that gracious God. Parables always have a message for everybody, no matter who you are, where you are in life, what's going on in your life, what's behind you, what lies in front of you. Parables always speak to everybody. But what about all of us gathered here this morning? Is there a younger son here today, or in the car park, we're going to listen to them at some point? A sinner who needs to repent and return to God and find in him that gracious, welcoming father? Or may there be those who even, when you dig beneath the surface, have the attitude of the older son, the older brother. They appear to be close to God. They appear to know God. But they have little or no understanding of what it means to be a child of God and how God is such a good, good father. Everyone without exception will be spoken through this parable of the lost son that the logic of the stained glass window applies. 
Some will see it. Many will not understand it. But if we see it, and things aren't right between ourselves and God, may he give us the grace to return to him in confession and faith. And if we are God's people today and there's something in our lives that just isn't right, may he give us the grace and work in our hearts to change our hearts to become more like him, more Christ-like. Amen. Before we come to meet around the Lord's table, we want to stand together and sing our next hymn. And for appropriate words to sing, we come as guests invited when Jesus bids us thank his friends on earth united to share the bread. And when once again, let us stand and sing together. church. This is the table of Christ. The bread, the wine, the invitation to eat and to drink are all his. He is our host and we are his guests. All who confess him as Lord from whatever branch of the true church you come, you're welcome here in this house and as we meet around this table. Hear the gracious words of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Let me read the words of institution from for the Lord's Supper as we find them in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 29. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. 
For anyone who eats and drinks without recognising the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. On the eve of Passover, Jesus spoke about the new covenant and all the pointers we have in scripture up until then, all the shadows, all the types, whatever word you want to use, all the figures, everything came to fulfillment in Jesus Christ and his work. His death on the cross was the climax of that work of redemption where he could say that evening about the wine, this is the blood of the covenant, and he was speaking about the covenant of grace. You see, the scriptures never speak of the covenant in the plural because there's only one covenant, that covenant of grace. This was the covenant promised to Eve in Genesis 3 where her offspring would crush the serpent's head. The promise to Noah in Genesis 6 about the preservation of life through the judgment that fell. The promise to Abraham in Genesis 12 that through him all nations would be blessed. The promise to Israel in Exodus 20 uh, on Sinai where through Moses God gave his people the law. The promise to David that his descendants would sit on the throne forever. You see these promises were all part of this covenant of grace which demonstrates to us what God is like because in spite of the way people have acted towards God and, and the way mankind treats God, robbing him of the worship that's rightfully his. Robbing him of the, the time and, and of giving him what is due to his name. God only ever acts with grace. Return to me, he says. I am being patient. I am long suffering. I am a God of grace. I am giving you every opportunity. God continually and consistently shows his patience and grace. And he is the one who does not change. No shadow of turning with him, as the hymn writer reminds us. At Passover, Jesus ate with a group of people who were rebellious. They were slow to learn. They were wayward. They were a group of sinners. And on that evening, Jesus ate with the one who would betray him, saying, take and eat and drink all of you. This was a meal for sinners. Now the table before us remains a meal for sinners, but not just any sinners but for covenant sinners and the fact that this table is prepared for those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour. Those who have responded in faith to the call of the gospel, who belong to the family of God, who have repented of their sins, who know that forgiveness so freely offered by this God of grace. Yet those who remain broken and sinful people. This invitation to take and to eat and drink goes out to all who know Jesus. All who love him, who know him as Lord. Those with a faith that is struggling, as much as those who have a faith that can move mountains. We are encouraged to take, to eat, to drink, and to be strengthened. Looking to Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith. Remembering our hope is built on nothing more and nothing less than the righteousness of Christ alone. Before we partake of the elements, let's still our hearts once again as we come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. God of glory, you are majestic in holiness and in your presence we are so aware of our unworthiness, our sinfulness from head to toe and that we deserve nothing more than your just condemnation. Yet you are the God of grace and patience. The one who does not change and we rejoice in this great truth that in spite of our sinfulness, waywardness and rebellion, you invite us to come, to take, to eat, to drink and to do so as we remember Jesus. The one who cleanses us from our sins and the one who clothes us in that righteousness that he emphatically won for us on the cross at Calvary. So Lord, we take these elements which are before us. These gifts which are a sign of all that you've done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask as we participate together here as your people, as we join together in the simple meal that by your Holy Spirit, you enable us to feed upon your Son in our hearts by faith. That you would help us appreciate in a deeper and a more meaningful way all he has done for us. The curse he has endured for us and from which he redeemed us. In order that we would be strengthened to the extent 
that our lives might increasingly proclaim your Son crucified, risen and glorified. For we ask it in his name. Amen. As the Lord Jesus took bread and wine and gave thanks, so we take these elements of bread and wine for his use and ours in this sacrament. According to holy institution, example and the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, and as a memorial of him, we do this. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. once together again in prayer let us pray our father in heaven we give you thanks and praise that you have made us to be your very own people through the death and resurrection of your son Jesus and through the life giving power of your Holy Spirit loving God you graciously feed us with the bread of life with the cup of eternal salvation and may those of us who have received this sacrament today be strengthened in your service May, Lord, just today to sing your praises, to tell of your glory and your truth. May those who have just heard of the greatness of your love proclaim through your word today. Or might it be of encouragement to us in the week that lies ahead. Father, we pray for your church family here in order. We remember those who face daily struggles with the hardships and realities of life. We think of those who have been bereaved recently. 
Remember those battling ill health, those who may have undergone surgery and others who may await it. And Father, we just pray for those who may face their own private struggles in life or things that they are reluctant to share with others, unknown to everyone else. Lord, just be with them today and might they know your presence and indeed your strength as they face just that battle, Lord, each and every day. We pray that in days when the pulpit remains vacant, that you would hold your people together here. We thank you that they have now got leave to call and we ask that through the process you would be with Mark as he acts as convener and you would lead and guide members of Kirk Session as they seek your will as to who will minister here and what we trust will be in the near future. And we thank you for the faithful gospel ministry here in the past and we know that all things are known to you or you already know who will minister here in the future. And Father, we know that that will only be revealed to your people at the choice of your timing. But we thank you for the assurance and the confidence that we, we receive because we know you love your church and the fact that in all things you bring glory to yourself. Lord, we ask these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to say and to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our closing hymn uh, this afternoon, which is My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pain, who plumbed the depths of my disgrace and gave me life. Again, and just having worship together, just having men around the table together, even in a different way than we're accustomed to, it's good to sing thankfulness. Our hearts are indeed filled with thankfulness for what God has done for us. So let's stand together and sing. Amen.